Welcome to Bizjet TV. Today we have super guest Charlie Precourt, astronaut, pilot, and lots more, and also an entrepreneur. And he's going to be sharing some of his life stories with us today. Charlie, welcome to the show. Fabrizio, thanks. Great to be with you this morning. So let's start by talking about, tell us how you got into flying and, and how your career path led you from the Air Force to, to being a NASA astronaut. So let's start when you were a kid. How did this idea sure. of flying airplanes come to you? Well, it was through my father. You know, my dad uh, picked up flying from friends uh, and when he was in his uh, mid-30s. And um, he used his little airplane for, for flying on business trips up in the northeast of the U.S. for part of his business. And as a young kid, I got enthralled with it when he'd take me flying. So that's a common story, right? A lot of us, yeah. especially our generation, grew up be uh, learning to fly because of our parents. And, and that was uh -huh. my story. And uh and it was a family business and I was the oldest son. So dad always figured that I'd be inheriting the business, but he gave me the flying bug and off I went to the Air Force. So, so when you joined the Air Force, I mean, that was the, the space stuff was already starting, wasn't it? Did you ever have it in was. your mind I'll go to space or, or did that just well, happen as you moved it, along? It, funny story about that. So Apollo happened um, when I was in my um early teens, um, 1969, uh, landing on the moon, I was 14. So I was literally growing up watching. Oh, I was two months old. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so funny story, we went back to school after the summer break. And as typically would happen, the teacher says, let's go around the room. Everybody tell us what you did during your summer break and what you want to do when you grow up. And the gal in the row next to me told her story and said, and when I grew up, I want to be an astronaut. The whole class started laughing yeah, because it was such considered such a far, you know, fetched idea. And so few people would, would ever do that. And I'm thinking, well, that's what I was going to say, but I ain't saying it now <laughs> after everybody had laughed. Yeah. So, so in any event, um, I had always had the space program uh, as I saw it as an extension of flying. And, and since I was learning to fly uh, through high school and had d decided to go off to the Air Force Academy because of the potential for a flying career, I always thought that uh, the, um, the potential to go to NASA was out there in the future. Yeah, uh, I love math and science, so I pursued an engineering degree. I, 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 after I was in the Air Force for a, for a while, I pursued being a test pilot. So all mm -hmm. those things that the early astronauts were um, part of in their careers were things that interested me, uh, mm -hmm. but I was realistic about it. I knew that it was a long shot, just like the gal in the class next to me. Um, yeah. So in any event, that's kind of the pathway I took, and I was fortunate enough with the space shuttle program to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah. So did you get in to NASA your first attempt, or did it take you a few attempts to get I, in? I did. I was pretty fortunate. Um we had, uh, you know, I flew F-15s in Europe um, yeah. right before the Cold War ended, before the wall came down. Yeah. And then I went off to test pilot school at Edwards and, and uh, spent five years there flying um, uh, multiple uh, flight tests and well over 100 different airplanes and just a wonderful flying assignment and a big learning assignment about flight in uh, general. And mm -hmm. um learn to respect the machines for what they are in particular. Yeah. Um, and, um, and Challenger happened while I was there, um, okay. the year after I finished um, flight test school. So there was a delay in the selection process, which probably helped me. Um, and then the, um, the head of the test center at Edwards Air Force Base was a returning astronaut from NASA and uh, Roy Bridges. And he, uh, helped me. Um, he he left after Challenger, came back to the active Air Force, ran the test center, and he helped me, convinced me, go ahead and put your application in, advised me on how to do that. And then I went down and interviewed, and the interview is a week long down there in Houston, and I got lucky. I got selected among a number of folks. could have, you know, that's the thing about selections there. There's so many qualified folks. I can uh, imagine. That, uh, uh, yeah. So, so you got in and how long was your training and, and how long did it take you to get into space the first time? So the training is continuous um, and it's typically a year of basic, what we would call basic training, where we get introduced into the workings of the, the system, how the flight control center works, how the machine works, um, everything from the subsystems and studying APUs and hydrazine and rocket engines and things that aren't on airplanes to 
how to fly the trajectories in the simulator, how to land mm -hmm. the thing. We used to train to land it in the Gulfstream G2 that was highly modified. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, how to work with the scientists that have developed experiments, what on orbit life is like, daily routines, um, just it's continuous training. Mm -hmm. um, and a year of it is to give you a smattering of all of that. And then once uh, after the year, you're eligible for assignment. I flew my first assignment in early 1993. So I did a year of the basic training. I did a year of enrichment training uh, with an assignment to be what they called a capsule communicator or a CAPCOM. We didn't have yep. a capsule in the shuttle program, but that was the name that they had traditionally. Yep. It's the astronaut in the control center that actually communicates with the crew. So you, are you the guy on the ground talking to the guys yeah. in the sky? Yeah. Okay. So that was my enrichment assignment, waiting my first flight assignment. And then I, I flew that first flight in early 1993. So it was two full years and a little bit more um, to get into the, the, uh, the first flight assignment. So what were, the, what were the, the biggest challenges that you had to overcome during the astronaut training and how different was it compared to your Air Force training and test pilot training? The general flow of things was very logically the same. You know, everything is mission oriented. What do you need to know and, and how do you handle, um, you know, the unexpected, a lot of emergency procedure training, a lot of memorization of emergency procedures, a lot of uh, what if scenarios in the simulators? We had different simulators. We had a an asset entry simulator. We had an orbit procedure simulator. We had a uh, the Gulfstream G two for landing, like I said, mm -hmm. um, and and you had to piece together all the different parts of the mission in these different simulators. There's no one simulator for the whole thing end to end because you're okay. going to be gone for ten days, and every minute of ten days has something that needs to be simulated. Mm -hmm. um, so probably the biggest challenge was just the things that aren't airplane like, you know, the yeah. rocket uh, engine, the orbital mechanics, um, the different uh, systems that we had to learn. Very, very complex uh, machine. It's uh, um, had uh, five major uh, computers that uh, worked in parallel and and uh, everything was managed through the computer system. Um, including all the subsystems. So the access to managing the systems was very complicated, uh, literally a, a required crew kind of operation. And so um, uh, all of that was a challenge, just the sheer volume of information you had to absorb uh, was really yeah. a challenge. So when you probably actually- on the order of yeah. probably 10 to 15 times what you would go through for a type rating in a business jet. Oh, wow, nice. So when you eventually yeah. got into space for the first time, how different did you find it uh, compared to the training? I mean, was, were there unexpected things that happened while you were up there that, that you, you kind of weren't prepared for? Um, yes and no. The, the training was wonderful for how we operate the system and how we manage our time because it's a very mm -hmm. time sensitive operation. You can't get behind on things or things can snowball on you. So all that discipline of running the checklist and staying on time on the expected timelines. You know, once we get on orbit, just to give you a quick example, we have yeah. a limited amount of time to get the payload bay doors open okay. because that's the refrigerant system. It's the radiators are on the inside of the, the doors. So to start cooling everything, once we get on orbit, you got to get the doors open. So okay. the things that are really time critical, none of that was a surprise. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you're suddenly for the first time doing it in weightlessness, your body's adjusting to that and you're not the uh, first time fully understanding how your body's going to cope with that. You mm -hmm. tend to get headaches, you get uh, some people get nauseous. There's a lot of those physical things that you can't simulate well on the ground that you have to cope with. Yeah, uh, it's the body's an amazing thing, though. It learns to adapt to those mm -hmm. challenges. And each time I went on my subsequent flights, those things became less and less of an issue. OK, so it's just the first few days you needed to figure it out. Yeah. And, yeah. then, and then you adapted during your first mission. And then when you went on your second mission, you knew what to expect. Your body knew what to expect. You just it's amazing. Into, yeah, it's yeah. a subconscious thing. It's uh, the body's just doing its thing. And you no longer feel the effects like you did the first time. Yeah. So obviously you're up in space. And, you know, I get asked this question, and I'm sure you do. I mean, uh, is the Earth flat? <laughs> <laughs> so the question I would ask back is who's on the edge? They would know. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oop, fell off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, you, so you, 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 get, you get a lovely so view up there. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. So there are three things that, uh, you know, there's uh, space tourism is becoming a thing now. Yeah. And, um, you know, you have uh, SpaceX has taken some civilian astronauts to the space station. And then we've got, you know, Blue Origin with their um, yeah. uh, suborbital. And yeah. um, they took Captain Kirk to space. Exactly. And Virgin Galactic. What I would tell you is that for those folks, they would probably agree with this. There's three major things about spaceflight that would be memorable. Yeah. Um, one of them is just the excitement of launch and reentry going up in, in the sheer speed and, and the magnitude of it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that happens so fast for the uninitiated that it's hard to actually register it and remember it. So it's not a lifelong memory. Yeah. Um, the second thing would be just weightlessness and learning to live in that and adapt to it and floating. It's like you're floating in a swimming pool, but you're not getting wet. And that's, yeah. that's a very pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing would be the view of the planet. And okay. to your question about is the earth flat, it's certainly not. It's very, very round and the sky is black in every direction. And you can actually see the earth looks like it's glowing from inside with the, the sun is the only source of light. Everything else is black. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're outside the atmosphere, so the sun is not making the sky blue. Everything is sheer black as far as it can go. And yeah. it literally looks like our Earth is floating in an endless sea of blackness. So it's purely round. And I, 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 again, the, my question is simple. It's like if the Earth is flat, someone's on the edge, and we haven't figured out who that is yet. So you can go from any spot on our Earth in any direction as far as you go, and you never get to the edge. So if it's flat, where's the edge? <laughs> Yeah, now there's there's a book I read recently about where they interviewed a lot of people that've been to space, and it kind of changes the way you see life and see the universe. It How has it changed you? Um, they call that the overview effect. Yeah, and the overview like effect, I said, yeah. of those three things that are most memorable, it's the view of the Earth. It's um, uh, the view of the Earth is the thing that sticks in your brain, and yeah. it humbles you because you realize that. Um, uh, you know, you're one small part of humanity and you had the privilege to go to space and see the planet, the very planet that's supporting all of our lives. So it's very, very humbling. And that's what we call the overview effect. It has a mm -hmm. profound effect on, on everyone and their sense of being, their sense of why we are here, uh, the purpose of life, all those things come to mind. Uh, yeah. It's very, very life-changing. Now, as well as an astronaut and, and having been the, the chief astronaut uh, for a number of years, um, you're also an entrepreneur. So tell us a bit about your entrepreneur journey and uh, the airplanes that you've owned over the years. Tell us a bit about sure. th those two journeys, because I know that they, they, they kind of go go uh, forward in parallel. They, they do go in parallel. And, and um, I think the. Um, the way to think about that is the bug I got from my dad learning to fly as a youngster. Um, I, my first personal airplane was a very easy that I built myself. <laughs> so I really liked working with my hands and I built an experimental aircraft and, um, and uh, enjoyed that. It's a little two seater with a hundred horsepower engine. And, uh, and then uh, when I left NASA and joined uh, what is now Northrop Grumman and I ran their propulsion business, um, I bought a Mooney aircraft and, and flew that for a few years and then uh, moved up into a, a jet prop, a, a converted Piper Malibu Mirage with a PT-6 yep. uh, on the front uh -huh. end and a very, very nice machine. And then uh, eventually moved into the Citation. I fly a CJ-1 Plus today and use it for business travel and and um, have it updated with Fusion Avionics and CPDLC nice. and all the modern bells and whistles. I really love it. Tell you, all of those have been key to uh, my business life because I can go places and conduct me meetings in multiple cities in one day, do things that I could never do with a typical airline uh, schedule. Um, yeah, so tell us a story of where. Meeting. Tell us a story of where you you went on a certain trip with your private jet to to have some meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, where did you land? How long were the meetings? And how did you manage to do multiple meetings in one day? And that tell us a a story or two about that because those those that are watching sure. will, 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 will want to sort of relate to that yeah so I, for instance when i was with north of grumman um our customers were the defense department and also nasa and um because rocket propulsion is used by both of those yep. agencies obviously and our company was producing rocket engines and motors and 
boosters and things of that nature. And, mm -hmm. and so um, on a particular trip to uh, from here in Utah in Salt Lake City, um, Huntsville was the center where the Marshall Space Flight Center is for NASA. And to get to Huntsville, uh, you in Alabama, right? Alabama, yeah. You yeah, have to either yeah. go through uh, Nashville or Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, there is no direct from here into there. And so yeah. a meeting in Huntsville with our NASA leadership would require two to three days. You have to fly down the day before meeting that day and then either fly out that day or the next day. Whereas mm -hmm. with my aircraft, I could fly in for a, a, a noon meeting. I could leave here in the morning and make it there, go direct into Huntsville and land at the Huntsville Executive Airport and drive over and and then I could leave and go on to Washington, D.C. the same day or or go down to Kennedy Space Center the same day. And I could be, um, you know, two, three meetings in the course of an overnight, a single overnight instead of one meeting. So did that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it really paid big dividends. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. Saving your stacks of time, of course. Now, um, tell us about the um... Citation Jet Pilots Association, which you're, you're involved in and that. And we've had a number of guests on here that are part of the association, but you're mm -hmm. heavily involved in the pilot training. We were talking just off camera earlier about pilot training these days. So let's sort of delve into what have you really, what are you doing helping pilot training with Citation Jet Pilots and how important is that today? Yeah, it's, it's really a uh, fascinating journey that the organization has been on. They started oh, 15 years ago or more now, um, as a, um, a typical owner pilot association that does a lot of uh, social activities. They have regional fly-ins and they get together for dinners. And then they realized that they were getting large enough that they really ought to focus on safety and mutual support. And there were a couple of accidents of members that really kind of hit them uh, hard and they said, we should start a safety program. And a, a couple of them were good friends of mine. This is before I joined the organization. And they asked me to consider helping them start a safety program. And I said, well, sure. Okay. Um, and uh, we spent with a very good group of about five, six, seven of us spent quite a bit of time imagining what that would mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the first things was to establish a safety stand down and um, and so at the convention, we inserted a day, a full day on safety content, and it was a huge hit because the members really felt like they were getting information about flying that they couldn't get in their safety training or their recurrency training in the simulator because those are compact uh, syllabi that you have to do certain things. And we were giving yeah. them enrichment that goes beyond uh, checking the squares and doing what the FAA requires. We're giving them things that really help them with their, how they fly the airplane, uh, the kinds of flying that they would do, like I just described for my own flying, right? Yeah. What are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about that you there's just not been enough time to train you on? So it was a big hit. And, uh, and so we evolved it into a number of initiatives. We started studying accident rates. We started looking at flight data. We have 90 of the members now have flight data monitoring with a focal program. Okay. And uh, we've learned that uh, this is a group of folks that flies a good jet. They're three years without an in-flight accident, or actually more, three and a half now, three and a half without mm -hmm. an in-flight accident or incident. Yeah. Um, they're dedicated to these programs that we've started. So we have flight data monitoring. We have a, um, a gold standard training. Uh, program mm -hmm. where we require them to do two uh, six-hour sessions. One is a, is a 6158 recurrency. The other is a, is a simulator or airplane with instruction on things that keep them current more than just mm -hmm. once a year. So mm -hmm. even though the FAA would let you go once a year with a 6158 recurrent, uh, you know, that doesn't mean it's the right way to train and be proficient. So we want multiple touches per year with training. We have a third requirement for enrichment training. Go get an altitude chamber. Go get another mm -hmm. rating. Do things to enrich your general flying skills. Keep yourself immersed in training. We have the convention stand down. We have on on for on uh, online forum discussions. So this has grown dramatically so that people can be exposed to training continuously. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. And, and I think the, the key there is, is the continuous. Very large. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, okay, good. Now, pilot training in general these days, we're, we're noticing a dumbing down in the education system with kids. And it seems to me 
is starting to do a dumbing down in pilot training as well. Now, for the entrepreneur that's watching this right now, that's thinking, I'm going to learn to fly and eventually buy my own jet and fly myself around. What yeah. type of training do you think they should go through besides the usual private pilots instrument, you know, the tick the box FAA stuff? What other stuff would you throw in there? I mean, I, I always say, tell people, start with gliding, start flying gliders. Because you learn the weather and you learn aerodynamics better if you can if you can fly without without an engine, um, yes. and then aerobatics is another thing I think is important, uh, but that I, not everybody does. I, I agree. I think those speak to that third category of our gold standard training program, and it shows that they're doing more broadly things that matter. So I mm -hmm. agree that aerobatics is is important, uh, at, and. Upset recovery training, some people look at that as aerobatics. It falls short of full aerobatics. But yeah. the idea is to learn how to handle the airplane when you're not just straight and level or 30 degrees of bank or less, right? So the idea is to understand uh, the effect of unloading the airplane to prevent a stall and, and, mm -hmm. and knowing what the first move is when you get upset, when you suddenly find yourself at 90 degrees of bank or you have the stick shaker going off, um, you get a wake turbulence event. Those things that are very unlikely, mm -hmm. the first move you make is the most critical thing to get you out of it as effectively as possible. We've mm -hmm. had several incidents of, uh, there was one over in Europe where a, um, a uh, stick shaker stall was control and it, it, uh, it made several rolls on the way down and it caused structural damage. They managed to land it, but if had that been the right first move, it would have been a much more benign recovery if that individual had had some upset recovery training. So all of those are really important to rounding out skills that take you to the, to the edges of the envelope of the airplane you're going to fly. They're very, very important things to understand. Yeah, so let's Gliding, just go like back to is, is really important. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's go back to the space bit, because there's a lot of stuff happening now with the, the, the so-called new space race, which is not uh, yeah. between countries anymore. It's between entrepreneurs. Um, right. <laughs> where, where do you think this is taking us? You know, Elon Musk is saying we're going to go and live on the Mars and whatever. I mean, how far away do you think we are from establishing a moon base and a Martian base and maybe going beyond the solar system? You know, there's lots of science fiction stuff out there. I love sci-fi, by the way. Um Star Trek, Star Wars, I mean, Stargate, you know, I, I'm, I'm there. Um, but, you know, uh, what's your view on, on this whole new space race? Do you think it's good for us? Uh, do you think we're eventually going to get to Mars and, and beyond? I mean, and, and, you know, tell us your take on all this. I, I, I think it's fantastic for us because uh, it's in our human spirit that we want to explore. We wonder about these things. Just the fact you're asking tells us that people have an extreme interest in it. They have yeah. a fascination with it. Um, but the fact that it's been so long since we've been to the moon speaks to just how difficult it is, right? And yeah. so taking large numbers of people to a place like a moon base and having them live permanently is is probably, you know, decades in front of us. But establishing a base, much like the McMurdo Station in Antarctica, where there are researchers who are there mm -hmm. year round and they cycle in and out and do research, that's a very real, realistic objective mm -hmm. and that can happen in the next 20 years uh, where we yeah. go back to the moon but we have a, an infrastructure that allows us to stay research and learn things and one thing is certain is when we do those kinds of audacious uh, initiatives uh, they bring back benefits to our life here on earth and people say why yeah. are we spending money in space we actually aren't spending it in space we're spending it on earth it's just the activity happens to be out there and, and what it brings back to us is, is phenomenal. And we've seen that for decades. So yes, I think uh, we will get to a base on the moon and we will eventually get to a base on Mars, but for large populations to live in either place is unlikely. They are not the kinds of places that you'd wanna live. You can't go out and yeah. jump in the pool. Um, yeah. Neither of them have atmospheres that allow you to be outside without being in a pressure suit. So. They are exploratory places where we can learn a lot and move our humanity to even greater places for the benefit of life on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting when you ask about how they, they say we're going to take and populate Mars. There's this fine line between fantasy and reality. And mm -hmm. Werner von Braun, who was the master of the Saturn V uh, as an engineer, was very adept at that when he was speaking about the goals and dreams of the space exploration program in the Apollo days, it was to engender this excitement so that funding for it would follow. 
Mm -hmm. And it's the same psychological thing going on now. We engender the excitement. We reach into the the fantasy knowing that reality may be a little short, but Mm -hmm. the fantasy is what enables us the motivation to go actually execute what's doable. So it's just a Mm -hmm. fascinating thing to watch. But yes, I do think we're eventually going to see a permanent base on both moon and Mars. Yeah, because they're talking about having the gateway station orbiting the, the moon. And that mm-hmm. kind of step one to then building yep. something on the moon built it, by exactly. robots so, makes sense. Send the robots yes. on the moon to build the, to build the base. Yep. And it becomes something more sustainable, right? When we went the first time, you saw how huge Saturn V with the Apollo capsule on top was. And yep. the only thing that came back was something that could fit in my breakfast nook here. Yeah, I've, I've been in the time. Apollo 11 capsule at the yeah. Boeing Museum in Seattle, and yeah. I saw how small That's it was. How and how much energy out. you you think about how much energy is required to go do this. The only thing that they could get back was that. Everything else had to be expended. So the yeah. idea is to set up an infrastructure that can make it sustainable, and that's a lot more challenging. Yeah, and I agree with you. Going to live on Mars doesn't appeal to me because <laughs> uh, there's nothing there. Um, a short yeah. stint might be fine, but <laughs> yeah, I mean they're talking about these these what they call exoplanets that that supposedly yeah. can house human life, but you know they're like four, five, six, seven, ten light years away from here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and obviously we got yeah. to get there, and and right now yeah. we don't have the, the speed to get there. Um, exactly. I don't think anybody wants yeah. to sit in a in a in a in a spaceship for like five years or ten years or twenty years um, <laughs> in suspended That's animation. Exactly, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> with all the things that could go wrong between here and there, which, you know, we don't know. Um, well, there was a, even a dream that they'd take 100 people at a time. And can you imagine being with 100 folks in a little cabin that takes just three months to get somewhere? <laughs> it's it's bad enough in a cockpit but sometimes. I mean, <laughs> with, with the airline, sometimes I've been paired with guys for like 10 hours that I, that I don't really get on with. Um, yeah. So it's bad enough in a cockpit for 10 hours, let alone in a, in a, in a capsule for like 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That was my one of my one of my challenges as the chief astronaut was matching people's personalities on crews so that they could actually be productive. And, uh, you know, that, that that interaction among a crew is very, very critical. Now, that's interesting. You come up with it because that's what I've always said. I've always said that when they're telling me, oh, we're going to go to Mars and it's going to take three months to get there. Then we're going to stay there for a year and then we're going to come back. So so you're talking like two years between going there, staying there and coming back. So exactly. you've got 10 yeah. people going to Mars. And it, you've got to really make sure that these people are going to get on with each other. And then there's so many things that are unpredictable. You can't plan for that are going to happen between now and then. How are these people going to react individually and collectively? Big question. That's exactly right. And and we learned it with, uh, you know, way back in Apollo, Apollo 8 and Gemini and two guys uh, flying for 10 days in a Gemini capsule. And, you know, the Apollo 8, when they were the first to fly Saturn V and leave the Earth's environment and the first to circle the moon on Christmas Eve. And mm-hmm. I mean, those are those are challenging uh, events to be a part of, let alone the interpersonal reac- interactions that have to to make them successful. You know, the, just an extremely complex thing when you look at the personal and the technical and the human machine interactions and the human to human interactions. It's it's uh, an immense undertaking. Yeah. And then the next question, which you probably get asked a lot, do you believe in aliens? <laughs> I I do believe there's life outside of Earth, um, and there's got to be life elsewhere. It's just you just referenced it. The distances to other yeah. habitable places are so great that um, I, I've always said, you know, if there is someone who has mastered the ability to travel that far, another life form. Um, and, and we have folks that say, well, I've seen a UFO and I've seen aliens. Well, why are there so many of these sightings and none of them have ever, you know, openly said, we're here, we want to interact. You know, it's always something in secret. It just doesn't make much sense. So um, yeah. if they're that, if they were that intelligent and able to travel where we can't, um, you would think we would all know about them. So. Um, yeah, but maybe, maybe, you know, the way I look at it is maybe these people have been or are visiting our planet and they don't want to speak to you know donald trump or the king of england um you know th- they want to come and speak to the i don't know farmer in outside buenos aires because yeah. he's he's more of a humble guy and you know and 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 interact with those people but also i mean i i've spoken to people that claim to have seen uh, who flying knows? objects and and the problem is and you and i know this that we are trained to identify things that fly 
Most people aren't. Yeah. So they believe they've That's seen true. an alien spaceship when it was either an airplane, a helicopter, a satellite, a flock of geese, <laughs> Venus, um, or, or, or just an experimental aircraft that's secret. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. And, and very often it's one of those. It, it's not some alien ship from Alpha Centauri. Uh, but still, I mean, I still think, you know, it, it, there, there could be the possibility of them having or b- visiting us yeah. right now. Who knows? It's not it's not impossible, but uh, hundreds of different observations uh, without any open, uh, you know, I'll call it public interaction is kind of unlikely. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I think you still I, and I and I honestly think we still have a long way to go before we're going to be allowed to adventure really out into space to planets where we can live, because we're not doing a good job with this planet at the moment. Um, and I don't think God's going to allow man to develop the technology to go out there until man is mature enough. To well, go you know, out the, uh, the, the just sustaining human life is really the challenge. Even a, a 10 day flight on the space shuttle, I did four of those. You, you suddenly appreciate just how difficult it is to sustain yourself when you're in a strange environment and you have so many things that you, you just take for granted here on this earth because it provides so much for us. Um, you have to take all of that with you. Um, and so that that's a huge logistical challenge and a huge daily life challenge. And yeah. And so, yes, I think the human is the limiting factor in any of this exploration we would do. It's not the technology. We, we've already sent rockets and robots and, and, you know, different things to Mars. Now we even sent a little helicopter. Oh, yeah. To, it's been flying around. Yeah. So we've, yeah. We've been flying to Mars for a long time, but we can't get a human there because it's so much more challenging. Yeah. And also, I believe the challenge is, is when you get back down to Earth. If you've been in orbiting with a space shuttle for two weeks, when you get back down to Earth, isn't it isn't it difficult to readapt to the gravity it, and everything? It, it is. It is. It's the it's the same. Uh, however, your body learns what that change is like. And, and on the first flight, I was very much out of my equilibrium, even balance and sense of weight and it's just very strange. But then the yeah. second, third, and fourth exposures, your body adapts much more quickly. So um, the longer duration, though, is radiation exposure and bone yeah. loss and all these things we're seeing on space station now, which is why space station is so important, is it's teaching yeah. us what will we have to do to protect the body um, and human you know, mental and physical condition while we're on these long exploratory missions away from planet earth. Yeah. Cause I believe radiation. Cause I, I remember flying with a captain years ago and he gave me this chart and I kept it with me and I used it as I became captain and flew around. Um, basically you would see the radiation levels at different flight levels and the latitudes. Yep. So, and you'd see sometimes between 31,000 and 35,000 feet, the radiation level spiked big time. So you mm-hmm. just, Stay at 31,000. Now, then you'd, you'd argue with your boss when you got on the ground, why did you fly low and burn more fuel? Um, <laughs> well, I don't want to get cancer. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but I've had a number of friends of mine that were flying the polar routes, in particular from the Middle East and that. Yeah. And one friend of mine who unfortunately died of cancer at 52 years old just a couple of years ago, he was flying Dubai, Houston. And they had a guy in the cockpit with them with a Geiger counter. And so he measured the level of radiation. He said, well, if you got exposed to this type of radiation and you worked in a nuclear power plant you'd have to be off work for a month so they landed in houston 24 hour rest and then they flew back again then they did the trip again two weeks later so he was saying to me you know this is not good i hope i'm going to be okay and then one day he gets back from a flight and he had a bit of a headache and he went to the hospital and they discovered he had a brain tumor a year later he was dead um and this is a dear friend of mine great pilot great great guy um, and sad to see something like that happen. But, and it was the radiation that really probably did him over over time because he, he was flying be, these yeah. routes all the time. We we would manage um, with little dosimeters, um, little discs about that size that we'd have in our pocket while we were flying, and it would measure the radiation that we were exposed to during flight. And um, you know, when you're you're high altitude, you're above some of the atmosphere that protects us from radiation. Obviously, we get sunburn on the ground and you get higher levels of exposure. Yeah. The higher you go and you get outside the atmosphere and you get those of protective layers for us. So traveling to the moon, you've left all of those protection layers. 
and your exposure rates really skyrocket. So we have to protect crews on these long missions with layers that can um, isolate them from the uh, radiation while they're in transit or they would indeed be overexposed. So is that what a lot of the technology is now that they, they're developing for these rockets is protection for the crews? Yes, it turns out that um, a lot of the fuels that we use uh, are stored in a liquid uh, state like hydrogen and oxygen, even though they're yeah. gases as we know them, mm -hmm. we, we, we compact them and store them as liquids. And, and if you build a tank around the structure of the crew compartment, those fluids actually protect the crew from a lot of that radiation. So oh, there's materials, uh, there's some yeah. polyethylene materials that have been developed that also can line the sleeping compartments that can help protect the radiation. So that a lot of that's being researched on the space station today. Yeah, but even the 12 men that walked on the moon, that some of them are still living, but even those that passed away, they all lived quite a long life though. Even though they're, yeah, yeah, their exposure their exposure was higher, but for short periods. Yeah. So exactly. when I did my when I did my typical ten day flight on the space shuttle, it was the equivalent of a half a dozen dozen X rays. Wasn't, okay. It was more than I would have gotten on the ground, but it wasn't, you know, threatening. And so yeah. it turns out with radiation, it, it's an it's like sunburns. You know, it's an accumulative effect. And so the longer you're exposed, the more that you're your uh, cells in your body can morph from the exposure to the radiation and cause cancers. And so um, the, the missions to the moon in the Apollo days, again, were only 10, 12, 14 days. So that, yeah, they had huge exposures, but for very short periods of time. So it did not allow, um, the body did not have that morphology to create cancers that it would have had had they been out there for half a year, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So that's, right. the, that's the trick on these long exploration missions to outposts is radiation protection. Yeah. So let's uh, close with a question for young, uh, uh, an answer there for the young people watching uh, that want to become astronauts and, and, and pursue a, a career in aviation or the entrepreneur that wants to fly. I mean, what, what advice would you give somebody that's watching this that wants to pursue something uh, like, like you have done, uh, bearing in mind that, you know, the technology is going to really propel them probably back to the moon and Mars and maybe even beyond who knows in the next 30, 40 years. I, you know, the, the it, if you're speaking of um, youngsters that are in middle school, high school and going to college, it really comes down to what is their passion. And if flying and, and the dream of flight is their passion, then everything that they can get out of school with uh, education about science and math is critically important. Staying inquisitive and learning mm -hmm. to answer questions asking questions about why things work the way they do helps you to understand how you can be a part of that. And, um, and nothing's more important than, than taking advantage of everything school has to offer uh, so that they can build um, an, an academic foundation around what's going to be required to be in that profession. Um, as you know, for flying, it's never, you never stop learning. I mean, I'm still doing yeah. that with the Citation jet pilots learning about mm -hmm. how to handle Bach landings, you know, and going around after the missed approach point, little details that can get you in trouble in mountainous terrain, right? And uh, obstacle departure procedures. They're all very complex mathematical s s uh, problems that have solutions that mm -hmm. require a lot of understanding of science and math. So that's where you start is in being inquisitive and, and learning um, continuously. It's a lifelong journey. Learning. And uh, if they're- Yeah, but it's also- kind of thing, they can get there. It's also, Charlie, it's, it's not only a mental game, it's also physical in the sense of how important has it been for you throughout the years flying both airplanes and the space shuttle? Has it been, and even today, to keep fit? It's extremely important. I wear this ring on my finger called the Aura Ring. It's like a Fitbit and it tracks yeah. my sleep. It has sensors, it has position sensors, a little GPS thing knows my movements, it knows my uh, respiratory rate, my heart rate my um, body temperature, uh, my sleep cycles, it's got all this data and it tells me how well I slept. And, and, mm -hmm. and I notice over the years that sleep is one of the most important things for your ability to mentally be ready to mm -hmm. handle the challenges of flying. It's flying is an operational situation I'm confronted with decisions that you need to take in the moment. And you can't undo them once you've made the decision. You have to be able to live with the decision, be prepared to make it uh, do mm -hmm. I turn left or right? 
you know, and left's the mountains and right is the runway. Mm -hmm. uh, once you turn left, you're stuck. So that's an oversimplification, obviously, but an operational environment is one in which minute to minute decisions that have critical life and death results have to be taken and they can only be taken with confidence if you are prepared. And so mental preparedness, physical preparedness, being healthy and ready are very critical on top of all that academic learning, no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. Charlie, thank you very much. It's been a really a great talking to you. Lots of insights here for everybody watching, whether they're an entrepreneur, a pilot, or an aspiring pilot or astronaut. Um, great, great uh, to hear your story and to give hope to, to the young ones out there that are aspiring to go beyond where, uh, where no man has been before, as they would say in Star Trek. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show, Charlie. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Fabrizio.